We have a lot of information to share with you, obviously. Things are moving very, very quickly when it comes to the coronavirus. I'm stating the obvious to everyone here. I don't think for most of us, even who have been in public life a long time, we've seen a situation quite like this where we receive uh, extraordinary new information on what now literally feels like an hourly basis. So we are constantly making adjustments. We're also going to go over the numbers here, which are very sobering. We're seeing uh, intense increases in the number of cases uh, in the city, and I think we have to fully understand this is the shape of things to come. So uh, we'll start with saying we're going to be giving regular updates, but expect major changes from day to day because we've now seen a pattern of um, such extraordinary information coming in. It's forcing uh, very, very different decisions than we would have made typically, not only here, obviously, all over the country. But the last 24 hours have been very, very sobering. Um, Literally, uh, yesterday morning feels like a long time ago. Uh, we got a lot of information in the course of the day yesterday, a lot changed then, then last night it just seemed like the, the world turned upside down in the course of just a few hours. Um, so, you know, I think what we are seeing is more and more of a consensus on how to act, and everyone is uh, moving as quickly as we can. Uh, that said, you're going to see differences, of course, between uh, different parts of the country, uh, what public sector and private sector does, and I'm going to try my best to explain the specific approach we're taking, but again, it will be evolving literally daily and hourly, and we will update you constantly. In light of uh, several new developments, obviously the, the numbers that we now have seen over the last 24 hours here in New York City. Uh, what we're seeing nationally and internationally, um, the reality of community spread that's been with us over these last few days, uh, and the close uh, working relationship between the city and state, uh, the decisions that we are making together, and I spoke with uh, Governor Cuomo at length earlier today about a specific set of decisions, and obviously you heard his um, announcements earlier today, which he and I discussed in detail, and which I agree with fully. In light of all those changing realities, it is time now to declare a state of emergency in New York City. And I will explain what that means, uh, the powers that invests in me, uh, what it will allow us to do going forward. I'll also emphasize that the declaration of state of emergency authorizes the use of the powers, but we will use them as needed it doesn't mean everything will happen at once. And we're going to try and be very, very careful to give you accurate information about what the city is doing and why. Uh, there's already some very inaccurate information out there, which we'll speak to uh, later on. But I want to ask all of you in the news media, if you're hearing uh, things are being attributed to the city of New York, uh, please ask if it's true or not. We will confirm with you instantly. It's very important that the people of the city know what is really coming from their government and what is not. But now, again, it's time to sign this state of emergency declaration. And continuing on the conversation with the governor, again, I fully support, we are in total agreement, uh, his decision related to large gatherings. Uh, so we will be working with the state to enforce that uh, new rule. That uh, relates, obviously, to anything where over 500 people would gather, parades, rallies, concerts, sports events, professional conferences, et cetera, and all of our largest venues uh, will now no longer have gatherings until such time in this crisis as it's uh, acceptable to do so again. And again, I unfortunately suspect that will be a number of months. So places like Barclays, uh, Madison Square Garden, Radio City obviously will not be operating. As you heard, for uh, most venues that will begin 5 o'clock Friday, for Broadway, as I understand, begins 5 o'clock tonight. 
also agree with the decision for gatherings of under 500 people. This essentially refers to um, non-essential, non-workplace-related uh, dynamics. So we're talking about events, we're talking about restaurants, we're talking about bars. Gathering places under 500 people will be mandated to have occupancy levels at 50% or less of their legal occupancy. That will allow for space between people, that will allow for some uh, effective opening up of those spaces. Uh, we understand, obviously, thank you, that uh, some businesses will choose to uh, work with these rules because they can make it work economically or they want to stay open for the long haul. Other businesses, I won't be surprised if they believe that's a situation where they'd rather close temporarily. It will be up to each business, but those are the rules that we will enforce from this point on. Now, I want to say, and I know the governor feels the same way, and not with these decisions that we're making in the state and the city working closely together to make these decisions, we don't do any of this lightly. This is, this is difficult stuff because we know it'll have a serious, serious impact on a number of businesses. Uh, just talking about the over 500 people gatherings, I mean, that's a, in this city especially, a huge number of events, concerts, et cetera. That's really, really painful for the many, many people who work in that field let alone so many New Yorkers and people all over the country who really look forward to these uh, events, these concerts, these sports events, and, and it's really gonna be a, kind of a hole in our lives. And it's painful, it's not something we would ever want to do, but it's something we have to do. Um, I am going to use every uh, power that I have, everything we can find to support people Businesses and working people are going through this. Obviously, the state and even more so the federal government have the greatest powers to provide that kind of relief and support. We're going to urge them to do that. But, you know, we understand that this is going to be a huge dislocation for so many people, and it's painful. And it's obviously, as we've grappled with this crisis, our greatest concern has been how to balance all these factors and ensure that we could keep a functioning society and protect the elements of our society that are most crucial, our hospital system, our schools, our mass transit, all of this interconnects. And I can certainly say none of us wanted to uh, take this action unless it was 100% necessary because the impact it'll have on the whole overall picture and clearly the human impact, which is going to be really extensive. And, and we talked in recent days about a projection that this crisis could easily be a six-month crisis. We all know it could be longer, but then the recovery from it could take a really extensive amount of time. So, so going to this level is not done lightly, but it is the point where it's necessary. I'm going to give you some other updates. Let me start with the overall numbers, and I'll just double back to some other things. Again, these overall numbers are striking and troubling. Um, we now, and even compared to this morning, we've seen a, a big jump. We now have 95 confirmed cases. That is 42 new since yesterday, so you can see the progression now. We do have just a small, important procedural point. We are now going to define our cases as only New York City residents, so we had some Questioning that, rightfully so, the other day we said we were including one person, the original Westchester lawyer in account. We've taken them out of the count from this point on. This will only be New York City residents. Now, as of noon, and again, this is changing constantly, as of noon, the breakout we had, and I don't think this breakout correlates to the 95, so forgive me that this is um, not fully uh, aligned. But as of noon, by residency, it was 25 people from Manhattan, 24 people from Brooklyn, 17 people from Queens, 10 people from the Bronx, and five people from Staten Island. And we'll try and keep you updated regularly on those borough breakdowns. We have 29 people now in mandatory quarantine. That number continues to rise. We have 1,784 people in voluntary quarantine. 
It's a lot of bad news today. There's a lot of troubling news. There is one uh, small piece of good news that we talked about the other day, uh, and I'm not going to be specific to which individual because we are uh, getting some clearance on that, but we can say at least broadly that the first we have the first case of someone coming out of mandatory quarantine and able to go back to their normal lives. So even in the midst of the growth of this, we will see this. We uh, met with employers here in the Blue Room earlier today. I'll talk about that in a moment. We talked about the, the deep fears about losing members of their workforce and the, and the health dangers people face, but also the reminder that people will come through and will get back into the workforce and get back to being healthy. We'll talk about that in a moment. a couple of pieces here. I'll keep giving you some agency updates as they arise. We're very concerned about people's loss of livelihood. Um, in the kind of situation we've just described, especially where a number of businesses will be cutting back or shutting down. We're worried about uh, folks having trouble paying the rent. We want to emphasize if anyone is facing eviction uh, we want to help them to avoid eviction. If it is a sheer legal matter, uh, we will get them free legal help, and people can call 311 if they need it. Uh, for folks who are now uh, in a situation of distress, it will depend, of course, upon income levels and other factors. But if someone is uh, faced with eviction, or unable to pay the rent, in some cases, we can provide some short-term support through our Human Resources Administration. We'll get you more details on that, but anyone who thinks uh, that they need that help, uh, they can go to nyc.gov slash access HRA. And we'll get you more details on that. We are concerned about uh, people, again, who have less money because their employment has been compromised, running low on food for their families, our Department of Social Services is activating emergency food contracts, working with nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, to increase the amount of available food. We'll have more details on that in the next uh, day or two. And again, there's nothing that would be more important in terms of providing support and relief for people than federal action. We all understand in a national crisis, the federal government can provide a level of relief that state and local government simply can't. We need the federal government to move immediately with a huge stimulus program and a program of relief for working people, uh, paid sick days, uh, any number of measures that would help people through what could easily be a half year or more. The House of Representatives has uh, put forward a stimulus plan that is very helpful and, and very positive step. We need to see action by the House, Senate, and the President as quickly as possible. Want to give updates about our school system. And I'll talk about the school in the Bronx in just a moment, but first overall, and this is absolutely essential to our strategy, and something we are working very, very hard uh, to continue to keep continuity on. I know the state feels the same way. We want our schools to remain open. We intend for our schools to remain open. That said, there are non-essential and non-instructional activities that we will alter. They'll either be moved online if they can be, or they will be canceled. Depends on each activity. So that includes PSAL activities, uh, athletic activities, games and practices. Uh, assemblies, parent-teacher conferences, PTA meetings, and school plays and recitals. And I will stay on the topic of schools and then double back. This morning we have a potential, and please everyone accurately uh, note this, we do not have independent confirmation. We have a potential case of a student at a school contracting this disease, but it is self-confirmed. We do not have a medical provider or a testing agency that has independently verified that. That is not 
uh, in any way uh, doubting what the individuals are saying. It's saying that we have to make a series of decisions and we need medical confirmation. We don't have it right now. We hope to have that confirmation in the next uh, hour or two. Uh, two schools and the chancellors here, and obviously we'll add in the Q&A. Chancellor, I'm gonna make sure I describe properly. If there's anything you need to correct me on, feel free. Two schools in the same building, the Laboratory School of Finance and Technology and South Bronx Prep. This is in the Mott Haven neighborhood in the Bronx. The school is at, or the two schools are in a building at 360 East 145th Street. Again, this was a decision we made this morning, a little after 7 a.m., based on decisions, excuse me, based on information that had just come in. And it was a tough decision because we did not have that confirmation, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, determined that it was the right thing to do to close the school, uh, to work to get that confirmation. If we were so lucky as to get a negative confirmation, that would be ideal. If we get a positive, it's quite clear the follow through. In the meantime, the full uh, disinfection and cleanliness regimen is put in place in the school today. Uh, the disease detectives from the Department of Health have been deployed to figure out any close contacts, as we said would be the case in any potential temporary school closure. We have checked the school, and we'll keep double checking, but as of now, there are no children in the school who reach what we call a tier one uh, level of pre-existing medical conditions. So children who would be particularly vulnerable, we're double checking that, but as of this point, we do not have an indication of any children in the school having those particular pre-existing conditions. Want to talk for a moment about uh, two things, the city workforce and then uh, the private sector workforce on the city. Uh, we now intend to uh, authorize 10% of the city workforce to work from home. The specific details are being determined. So this is telecommuting. We believe that's a number we can hit in the short term, but it will take some real work. It's not the, the norm, obviously, for city employment. There's, as is obvious, a huge number of our employees who cannot telecommute who we need at their posts but we believe in short order we can have 10% uh, telecommute. I am, want to confirm that number. I believe that is 34,000, but I want to check that and our 35,000. Thank you, Commissioner. And then of the remaining 90% of the workforce, there are 20% we intend to put on staggered schedules. Again, understanding a lot of our folks not only play a crucial role, but cannot be on staggered schedules, but others can. So we, in short order, hope to put 20% on staggered work schedules, even as they report to their normal work locations. And I wanted that, so that's 20% of the remaining 90%. I want that number 70, two, do you know it? 70,000. 70,000, thank you, Commissioner. So between those two categories, that's about 100,000 city workers will either be in telecommuting or on a staggered schedule, get them as much as possible away from the rush hour. And again, our message to New York City businesses, uh, as much as humanly possible, please uh, authorize maximum telecommuting uh, and or staggered schedules for your employees. I wanna say it's our impression so far from the information we're getting that the uh, business community is really honoring that. Uh, a lot of them are acting on that. Uh, the meeting we had here, uh, which was organized with the help of the New York City Partnership and CEOs and business leaders of some of the uh, most prominent uh, businesses in New York City. Uh, just going around the room and going, with each of them, going through with each of them what they are doing, we saw a very, very high level of adherence to the guidance to institute uh, telecommuting, in fact, in the case of some of the companies which had the ability, obviously, if it's a technology company, for example, more capacity to do that. We had companies that were literally at 100% telecommuting now. Other companies are going to have a much harder time and strike a balance. Uh, this is a great example. One of the great New York City 
uh, iconic companies. Macy's CEO was here. Macy's in a different situation where a lot of their workers obviously work in physical locations, but they're working with us uh, to maximize any kind of adjustments they can make. So I want to say I appreciate the high level of cooperation from the business community. I also want to note every business is different. Um, some can do a lot of, have a lot of flexibility, others do not. They are all taking it seriously, they're all working with us. We do want to keep reminding any business that's not yet instituted maximum uh, telecommuting and or staggering work hours that we need them to, but we again are sensitive to the fact that not every business can do that and that we are simultaneously extremely concerned to keep people employed, keep uh, people from running out of their livelihood because that has a huge number of other ramifications. So we're trying to strike that balance, but very, very pleased with the cooperation we're getting. And we're gonna try and work with these businesses on any help they need as they proceed. Hang on one sec, okay. A couple of other matters. There's been concern about the special election scheduled for March 24th for Borough President of Queens. We uh, are analyzing those concerns, but I wanna be very, very clear that election will continue uh, as scheduled. We are dealing with an unprecedented challenge, but I think it is um, a signature of a stable democracy that elections happen when scheduled. <clears throat> so uh, we very much want that election to happen on time uh, so long as we believe it can happen effectively. However, I want to urge all candidates and campaigns to alter their activity right now. We're reaching out to each campaign specifically. Believe that door-to-door -door canvassing should be stopped immediately. And I want to note, and knowing a lot about campaigns over the years, campaigns have many, many ways to still be effective without door-to-door -door canvassing or rallies, clearly phone banking, uh, social media, email updates, digital ads, TV ads, radio ads. There are many, many ways, including some of the most effective ways to get the message out. So I think it's fair to say, and a campaign that's been going on for a while, uh, that the democratic process can continue here effectively and the campaigns do have other options for getting their message out. We do not need people going door to door canvassing and taking those risks. Uh, so we'll move forward. We have a lot to sort out, of course, about uh, making the voting process uh, as safe and effective as possible. But I do want to say, particularly with early voting, uh, the voting process is being spread out, so it's, a, I, it's almost its own version of social distancing. I can say from the first day of early voting I saw this, fewer people are congregating to vote. The voting process and early voting is very fast. Uh, and again, preserving our democracy is crucial. We'll talk about it in the Q&A, but um, we are more comfortable getting this done now than waiting. We have a related challenge, which is a huge challenge and something we really have to think through, uh, which is the census was raised in the Q&A the other day. This is gonna be a very, very complex matter and we have to see um, on the federal level if there will be any consideration of altering the census, delaying it, extending it, but my fear right now is that there will not be any change from Washington. We'll be put in many places, we'll be put in a really, really difficult spot. We're gonna to have to figure out if that is the case, some way to communicate with people to the maximum. It's almost impossible to engage the census without some kind of in-person activity, but we can alter the nature of the in-person activity. We've got a lot of important work to do on that. So that's an area of tremendous concern going forward. Last few points. And I'll be the only speaker, and we will uh, go to Q&A right after my remarks. My colleagues obviously will jump in on the Q&A. There have been questions previously about the homeless. And I've said we would come back with a specific update. Uh, we have now trained 550 outreach workers through Homestat. Uh, in the protocol for discussing uh, coronavirus with homeless folks, giving them information, checking on their condition, making sure they get the help if they need it. Uh, as of today, and we'll get the 
exact timeline on this, but we have 764 homeless individuals on the street who have been engaged so far. At this moment, we have no known referral, so no one that was uh, exhibiting uh, the symptoms or the specific dynamics uh, that led to follow-up healthcare activity, but we'll get more on that day by day. Uh, want to just say something simple about the president's remarks last night. Um, and I think at this point, there's, it's not worth wasting breath on everything that has happened over the last few weeks and all the missed opportunities. I think you know, we can at least say that last night's remarks indicated that the president is now finally taking the situation seriously. Um, the steps he outlined showed much more connection to reality than a lot of what we heard previously. But he was essentially silent on the single most important action that the federal government could take, certainly from the perspective of New York City, which is to get uh, immediate approval for a huge expansion of our automated testing. Uh, this is a tool that would be immensely helpful in addressing all the concern you're hearing from New Yorkers. So many people who want to get tested that we cannot prioritize right now, businesses that would like to test employees uh, that can't right now because we have to focus on the folks who have uh, the clearest symptoms and the folks who are in the greatest danger and the folks who have a nexus to travel or an existing positive case. We want to do wide-scale testing. But we cannot do it without the federal government coming in. Um, there has been talk of uh, localities taking matters into their own hands. I believe that that is what's going to happen if we don't get this federal approval. And I think this is bluntly the last chance. I think if the President of the United States and the FDA do not give us approval, uh, I don't blame any locality, any company, anyone who just decides to do whatever kind of testing they can at this point. And we will work with all of them. Finally, I want to say, um, all of us have been talking to so many New Yorkers over the last days, and we've been watching how people uh, are responding to quarantines, how their businesses are following up on guidance, um, how our public servants are reacting to the crisis, and I'm very, very proud of New Yorkers right now. Uh, it's been extraordinary. We're dealing with the absolutely, not only unforeseen, and uh, something on a level we have never seen in our lives. There is no precedent for this in U.S. history or New York City history. Uh, New Yorkers are handling this with tremendous strength and resiliency. People are stepping up. People are looking out for each other and their neighbors. We're going to need a whole lot more of this. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I want to be clear about that. We will be at this for months and months. This is, I said earlier today, this is a battle. We are going into a long battle. It is the opposite of when uh, you're told, don't worry, it'll all be over soon. This will not be over soon. This is going to be a long, long battle. It's going to be a tough battle. We are going to lose some of our fellow New Yorkers. That, unfortunately, is inevitable. But we can fight back. There's a lot we can do to help each other, to support each other, to protect people. We will unquestionably overcome this. It will take time, but we will. The city will prevail in the end. And the vast majority of people who are afflicted, thank God, will survive and will fully recover. But it is going to be a long, painful episode. The more that people are informed, the more they follow through on the guidance that we are trying to give them constantly, the more people support each other, the better off we will be. Anyone who needs information can go to nyc.gov slash coronavirus or text the word COVID, C-O-V-I-D, to 692-692 or call 311. Any of those approaches will get you information. Few words in Spanish, and then we'll go to questions. Debido a coronavirus, estamos cancelando eventos de más de 500 personas y limitando eventos pequeños. Estas precauciones nos ayudarán a proteger a las personas vulnerables. Agradezco a, excuse me, agradezco de nuevo a los neoyorquinos por escuchar nuestros consejos. 
Okay, with that, let us turn to questions and we'll go from this side to that side. Go ahead. Thank you. Since you just mentioned that this is going to get worse, uh, what number of cases or other metrics would trigger a large scale mass quarantine as we've seen in Italy and China? Could that happen in days? Look, I, I would say this. I think we can now say, as we're on the verge of 100 cases, my, I'm very sad to offer this prediction. I think we'll be at 1,000 cases next week. Um, we are modeling right now and wargaming, or tabletopping, whatever word you want, different scenarios for different actions. Uh, we're going to be doing this nonstop. So I just want to say to everyone here who has been extraordinary, I want to thank my colleagues. There's, you know, my colleagues up here are about to go through uh, six months without a day off, and they all understand what they just signed up for, and they're all extraordinary public servants. Um, we are going to be looking every single day at the numbers, at what we can learn from the rest of the world, at the various efforts to mitigate and decide what it means. I want to be very clear, and this is again an area of tremendous agreement with the state. There are three things we want to preserve at all costs. Our schools, our mass transit, and most importantly, our healthcare system. And all those pieces interconnect. So right now, we want to try and, in a sense, as we are indicating with the state's actions, with my actions, we're falling back to the next line of defense. And our goal is to, to the maximum extent possible, protect those three areas no matter what. We will scenario everything. Absolutely everything. And we'll look at every model, every situation around the world. But I also want to emphasize there's no two countries that are the same. It's an absolute fact. If you look at the different countries around the world that have had a serious experience with coronavirus, there's no two that have the same exact trajectory. It has a lot to do with when people got information, how much transparency, how they reacted, what kind of health care was available. There's all sorts of factors. But we're going to be constantly drilling for every eventuality. Yes? You mentioned that um, you, it might come to a point where the city is going to move forward with testing at a mass scale or automated testing. It seems like the most capacity is at the private hospitals. So have you been having conversations with the private hospitals to say, like, this is kind of where we're at. Are you on board? Is that something the governors have to convince them to do? Because that seems like the question. And, uh, yeah. Debbie Mayor, you're shaking your head now. You yeah, know? it's that point. It's that point. We have, I, I don't know how many letters, calls, public pleas to the FDA. And, and again, last night would have been the perfect moment for the president to announce the FDA was giving that approval or he was you know, ordering in what is becoming sort of a wartime situation that that approval be given. It's not, you can't do business as usual, but that, you know, that opportunity came and went and there's no new information today. So. Again, I think people are going to have to start taking matters in their own hands. We will work with those organizations to figure out the way forward. Mr. Mayor? Yes, please, Deputy Mayor. Just on, on that point precisely, I have a daily call with the president of the Great New York Hospital Association, Ken Rasky, and we are completely coordinated. We're tracking number of beds available, number of ICU beds, number of all equipment, medical supplies, testing capabilities, and we do that every day, part of the H&H &H system and the voluntary hospital. Thank you. That's exactly what my question is, which is, what is the capacity of the city? Can the city handle 500 cases a day, 1,000 hospitalizations a day? At what point does the city get overwhelmed by right. the event? It's not the, I, it's a great question, it's a powerful question, but I want to also make sure we're always clear about it. If we tried to give you that answer before we've completed the actual modeling and wargaming, we wouldn't be responsible. I can tell you the next milestone is 1,000 cases, and if you follow the, the very broad dynamic we've seen here and elsewhere of 80% of cases are, forgive my non-medical phraseology, low-level impact, a lot of people don't go to the hospital, overwhelmingly don't go to the hospital, can, can get well at home. 
20% are more serious. A lot of those will be hospitalizations, not necessarily all. Let's just use that as a working model. So at 1,000 cases, we're adding 200 more people. Look, uh, we have a huge, huge uh, medical system here in the city. So putting 200 more people in, yes, of course we can handle that. Uh, and, and Mitch can speak to that as one yes. of the people who runs one of the biggest pieces. But, and, and as Mitch said so powerfully yesterday, there's a bunch of things that would be retrenched in a crisis that got deeper, like ending elective surgeries and all. But it's an excellent question. What is that moment where we start to overtax the system? And I want Mitch to jump in with a reminder to what Mitch said yesterday, that he and other hospitals will create brand new capacity. They'll take a parking lot and put up a tent and turn it into ICU. They'll turn a cafeteria into an ICU. I mean, this again, we are getting into a situation where the only analogy is war. In a wartime dynamic, you turn all sorts of facilities into something else. You mobilize people, you change their roles, you do whatever it takes, Mitch. One of the ways New York City is so lucky is because there is a very strong hospital system. And Health and Hospital alone, with its 11 hospitals, we are prepared to take literally hundreds of people who are sick. So again, when you go back to what the mayor has said, that 80% of the cases are unlikely to need any hospital care, only 20% of people will be sick, not all of whom will need hospital care. Uh, I believe certainly for the foreseeable future, we will be fine. You have the ventilators, the respirators, the supportive equipment that you need for this kind of thing? Yes, yeah, so Health and Hospitals has 1,000 ventilators. We estimate that across the city there are 5,000 ventilators. And again, if you remember that it's only uh, likely 5% of people who would actually need yeah. ventilators, you get 20 times 5,000. Um, we have a huge amount of capability. Also remember, people will get well. Not, people will not stay on ventilators. So as somebody, there will be new cases, but as the mayor has also happily talked about, people do get over this infection. And so everybody is not going to be sick at the same time. Rich? So Mr. Mayor, of the, there's 95 cases now in the city, right? Of yes. Those, do we know how many are in hospital? How many, or do we have any sense of the condition of? 22 are in hospitals. Um, the rest are at home, isolation. A lot of them are doing well. Mr. Mayor, you talked about an intense increase in cases, perhaps as many as 1,000 by next week. We're talking here about hospital capabilities. What is the point where the city says, you know what, maybe we'd like not to get to 2,000 and we're going to start to shut things down, we're going to start to shut down schools? And, and why is it that the governor is the person who is shutting down parades and shutting down theaters when you're here in the city? And again, there's been a, again, listen to how this has progressed over just a few days. Governor and I have been talking, our teams have been talking. We truly, all of us, believed and believe that we had to be certain before we started what is going to be a, bunch, a lot of dominoes falling in terms of our society, the impact on people, the impact on people's livelihoods, uh, all sorts of other consequences. And we had to be certain it was the right thing to do. We're all coordinated here. So we now believe these are the right steps to take now. The danger and I just disagree with the analysis. It'll be an ongoing conversation, obviously. But the danger of going to a full shutdown is it will degrade not only um, people's lives on a host of manners, including their health and safety in other ways, but it's unrealistic in some very powerful ways. For example, where do our children go? And if our children have nowhere to go, then their parents can't go to work. That includes a lot of parents we depend on, first responders, healthcare professionals. It's a very slippery slope. If our transit system is not working, how will people get to those healthcare jobs? We can make some accommodation, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. So there's also, and, and the doctors can jump in on this very obvious point, there's nothing that says if you do these mass actions, it ends all your problems. The community spread has been established. You have to balance 
the negative impacts with the positive impacts. So that's what we're trying to do all the time. And the city and the state are coordinated on that. I appreciate the answer. Just a quick follow-up yeah. on the issue of testing. You've had doctors interviewed on TV, so they're not you know, people in the shadow. They're putting their names to it. Yep. Had, uh, former federal prosecutors saying every flu test has come back negative, uh, but they're not giving me a test for this. What is, and they're at, they're at Wild Cornell and saying that emergency rooms are overflowing. I'm not there. I can't tell that. But we're, what, is, what is going on with okay. respect to testing in this city? Where yeah. is the breakdown, it seems, in communication and, and action? I, I think there is a breakdown in understanding. And we need to clean that up and clear that up. But I want to caution on the Wild Cornell point. First of all, I appreciate your straightforwardness. You're saying you've heard a report, but you can't confirm it. I want to ask everyone, please, because there's going to be so much misinformation in these next months. I ask you all, the people are depending on all of you. Please confirm things before you put it out there. So for example, um, we've heard various people alleging uh, that emergency rooms were overflowing. I've turned to Dr. Katz constantly, said, what is your emergency room usage? As of yesterday, he had only one of his emergency rooms that had any unusual uptick in activity. Um, I mean, normal levels. I turned to the chancellor a few days ago and said, what's going on with attendance? It was not only the same as the same day a year ago, it was higher. We, we've got to separate the fact from fiction. So I don't know what's happening at Weill Cornell. The deputy mayor will find out right away and report to you and report to me if they're experiencing a particular challenge. Uh, but again, Mitch, you can give today's update. As of yesterday, you had one and only one that you thought was experiencing any kind of unusual right. size of our, uh, usage. Our system is doing well, and I think as the deputy mayor, when he said 22 cases, I counted five or hours, which again is consistent with what I keep saying, the health and hospitals represents about 20% right. of the city's capability, and we're, we are doing well. I, I can address and agree, and I, we've talked among ourselves, there are confusing messages out there among physicians. Um, people, right, health and hospitals as a government agency, we have an advantage, right? We're constantly able to send out messages. We've talked with the Department of Health, and we here is the latest recommendation, and it all gets pasted up, and it gets acted on, right? In medical practice, people have very diverse populations, and every doctor is not sitting there waiting for the next report. Oh, from yesterday, the testing criteria has changed. I can tell you that at the health and hospital facilities, we are following exactly what the mayor had described, that we're not testing people who are well, but we are testing people who have symptoms of fever and cough or fever and shortness of breath. We're testing them first to see if they have a flu or influenza or some other explanation, and those who are, who are not, we are sending for COVID testing and we have capability. But I certainly agree with the stories, and I've heard them myself, of person goes to X physician office, gets told something completely different. As the mayor said, you can help us by getting out the message of what's true. And I'm going to go let, through. Let me hold add on. To that. Hold on one sec. We're going to, Deputy Mayor wanted to jump in, then the commissioner, but I'm going to go through the exact prioritization and then who's not getting the tests. I want to be super communicative with you and why that FDA approval or whatever alternative we come up with is the hinge here, the pivot to being able to answer the concerns and make it more widespread. But first, Deputy Mayor and then the Commissioner. Um, as of this morning, in my call with Ken Rasky, the, the only increase in cases in the voluntary hospitals, including Well Cornell, is for people who are asymptomatic but worried. Now, if, if you actually see the picture right now, I don't want to escape this. 95 cases, 22 in hospitals is exactly what the mayor has been telling all of us, right? 80% would be okay, 20% go to hospitals, and out of that 20%, 1% will be severe cases in ICUs. So they're spread across all the different levels of service. Go ahead. 
So on the testing issue, um, I think at the very beginning there was certainly a lot of confusion. Some of it was because of the strict criteria that the CDC had put in place in terms of requiring um, a certain amount of travel in order to authorize the test. But as of this Monday, we released a health alert that goes out to thousands of doctors clarifying how it is that they go about ordering from the commercial labs. And we hope that that will start to clarify some of the confusion that there was earlier. Um, and in addition to being able to get the tests from H&H &H and from the uh, voluntary hospitals, there are places like CityMD that is offering the test as well. So just coming back on the overall situation here again. So the history is really important. The point the commissioner made, first we were getting a very narrow interpretation from CDC then, and of course we couldn't do our own tests. It was not until, it seems like a century ago, but it was 10 days ago that we first were able to do our own tests. It was Friday, so six days ago, that the private labs were doing their own test. Um, but we need to be clear, and I'll certainly take that on all of us, about the prioritization schema. Until we get the FDA approval or something, uh, another way to get to automated testing, what we've said is there's hundreds of tests that can be done a day. That is a true statement. It also takes too long. That's another true statement. Turnaround time, even with the private labs, H&H, &H, everyone on the playing field that can do what they can do, we still have tests that we wait three or four days for an individual result, okay? But at least the tests are moving. The problem is a lot of people, understandably, they're literally like, I don't have symptoms. I don't have anything. I'm just scared about coronavirus. I want a coronavirus test. That's nothing wrong with someone feeling that. There are people who have very mild, you know, initial symptoms that want a coronavirus test. There's all sorts of people. I don't blame a single one of them. But with the amount we have, what we've said is we have to follow the priorities. So the priorities are folks who have been exposed to someone with coronavirus, confirmed with coronavirus, folks who have come back from one of the impacted travel areas of the world to places where it's obviously prevalent, folks who are older and have those pre-existing conditions and are immediately in danger uh, in a way that others are not, and folks who have gone already through symptoms, the biofire test, have come back negative on the biofire, and now the very good chance that they could have coronavirus. Those folks all go to the front line, and doctors, if there's anything that needs to be refined in my answer, please refine. But those folks all go to the top of the line. That takes up a lot of what we have. The person who just wants out of an abundant caution to get a coronavirus test, we don't have that kind of capacity for. The folks who were here from the business community earlier raised the point, it was an excellent point. They said, if we've got someone in our company who has symptoms and, and you know, we'd like to rule them out so that we can tell everyone it's okay to keep working, you know, we'd like that ability, that wouldn't be a priority right now. We'd think that is a worthy concern but we need the more widespread testing to be able to do that. Mr. Mayor, I'm hoping you can explain the executive order, particularly section two, where you say you direct agencies to provide all appropriate and necessary steps to preserve public safety and require uh, all assistance available to protect the security, well-being, and health of the residents. How is that different from the status quo? Sure. The, um, I'm going to ask my, I need one document that I left in my office. There's a document from my general counsel with the delineation of variety of examples of what the emergency, state of emergency entails. So let me get that in front of me to just give you live examples. It clearly is uh, the status quo is when, as mayor, I can direct my agencies to do a, a whole host of things to protect the health and safety of New Yorkers, but the emergency order allows uh, a much deeper intervention uh, into the daily life. If I may just follow back to you. Yeah. So for example, these are just some of the uh, specific actions that can be taken. I want them, please, I'm gonna be treating everyone with real respect that I'm gonna be very clear when I'm giving you examples. This is none of these have been activated. Um, they are, uh, or when they have been activated, I will indicate it. But this is the range of potential actions that can uh, be involved by executive order under this state of emergency. So there's the ability to establish a curfew. There's the ability to regulate whether vehicles or individuals may enter or leave specific parts of the city. Uh, there's the ability to close down public transportation. 
That is the ability to order hospitals to postpone elective procedures, to ration supplies or impose restrictions on supplies and prices, uh, price gouging, I should say. The ability to suspend or limit alcohol use, firearms, explosives, flammable material, and liquids. The ability to prohibit or restrict people from being on the streets and in public places. One that we've obviously already uh, seen the state acted on and is consistent is the ability to regulate or close public spaces. Uh, there is the ability to create or designate emergency shelters, emergency medical shelters, and community-based care centers, the ability to limit a maximum building occupancy. These are some of the examples. So they're very extensive uh, capacity. I would follow up. At what point do you move from containment to mitigation? Are we there yet? We, we've been there. Okay, so the disease detectives have no more work? No, that's not a good question. And no, they do have work to do. Um, in a matter of days, it was clear, and unfortunately, I think the testing, uh, I'm not going to bemoan what's already too late. I think, I think if we had had early testing, uh, this could have been a very different trajectory. But again, this entire experience we've had with testing is 10 days old, and almost before we got started with it, we found that we were really struggling to maintain a containment stance. Now, you know, we saw community spread on Wednesday or Thursday really start to establish. We see the growth. There's only the one true cluster, I think, at this point still that we know of in Westchester, but we still see this growth pattern is very, very troubling. So it's a mitigation mode, but the disease detectives still have real, real value, and we want to keep augmenting their ranks because they still allow us case by case to achieve specific things. Anytime you know the pattern, of contacts, you can follow up with the folks who most need to be followed up with, and then that helps speed action, uh, follow through on their care, but also helps us to deal with other dynamics like what happens to everyone else who was not affected. So there's still very, very important work. Have they touched all 92 people in their contacts? Let's check on the exact, because obviously this has been. Are they aiming to be in touch? Yes, of course, that's wherever possible. Okay, go ahead. Is this option very much on the table at this point? And can you give us an update on the five um, different cases on Staten Island? You know, one is an EMT worker. Right. Another one we hear from sources is a coach uh, at St. So, school that may have been in contact with other students. Yeah, cannot give you individual updates. As we said, you know, you're, you're right to point to those examples as, particularly the EMT, as someone who we would pull out and try and give an individual update because of the ramifications. Right. Well, we talked about that the other day. The point being where we can give some particularly pertinent updates, we will. But the problem is with these numbers, it's going to be harder and harder to do so. So cannot give you uh, anything new beyond what I said the other day about the EMT. Uh, I'm not familiar with the situation with the coach. If we have information, uh, our uh, City Hall press team will get it to you. But generally speaking, in these briefings, unfortunately, we've gotten to a point where we can't do much on individual cases. On the schools. Again, we are going to fight tooth and nail uh, to protect our school system for it. Uh, many, many reasons. It is where our children are safe in the day, and many parents have no alternative. It's where our kids, a lot of kids, get their meals. Uh, it is the, the pivot for a lot of people we need to get to work to get to work, that their kids have a place to be. A lot of them have no other choice. They cannot bring their kid to work. They do not have a relative who can take their kid. And you could say, well, why don't we come up with an alternative location? Well, that creates the same exact problem. If a bunch of kids are congregated in a school or a daycare center or wherever it might be, if congregation's the issue, uh, it would be true anywhere. So we are going to do our damnedest to keep the schools open. We are going to scenario everything. As I said, and I've, I'm going to say it a few more times, and I'm going to respect your intelligence that I don't need to say it 100 times. We are scenarioing absolutely every potential uh, of what could happen to this city. Go ahead. Yeah, I, there's nothing else to add. The mayor's exactly, we were on the same page, exactly what the mayor has said. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, a question for you, Mayor, and then Sorry. I can follow on Dr. Katz's comments on testing. I heard you mention a six month timeline at least three times. What historical lessons have you learned from the Spanish flu in 1918 in terms of social distancing and the extent that you're using it now? 
So I think the most important thing to note is that when we put social distancing in place, it is to slow the spread and to reduce the potential harm to people who may be at highest risk for bad outcomes. But is there, I think the question was more about the history. So the lesson learned is um, putting in place the kind of measures that the mayor is announcing is a way to help slow the spread and reduce the harm to New Yorkers. And Dr. Katz, you mentioned testing. Is there any guidance that you want to offer to families about whether or not they should be giving their children medicine before they get to the clinic? Because as I understand it, personal experience, a doctor told me that unless the child is experiencing a fever in the office, that's one of the criteria for getting the test. No, that's not accurate. No, no good clinician would require that a child be forced to have a fever in order for it to be recorded. We believe when parents say, my child had a fever and then I gave them some acetaminophen and it went away. We understand. Okay, just finishing this side, first round. Okay, going over here, yes. There have been some calls to halt eviction proceedings in the city. I just wanna know if the city is going to step in to stop I don't know if the deputy mayor wants to discuss that because there are some people who are facing eviction and things will only progressively worse as the, as the virus continues. Yeah, and I, I talked about, and obviously the deputy mayor will add, but you know, we are clearly, for anyone uh, that needs the legal help, we're gonna do that. For some people, we can't necessarily do it for everyone, but for some people who need the um, financial help, we can help. Um, it is a very good question, uh, which we can follow up on and get back to you about uh, other more extensive actions that we could legally take, but Deputy Mayor, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, we are in discussions with the court system about um, what we could do under different kinds of authority where we have the capacity to stop anything we have. For example, NYCHA um, is not executing any warrants of eviction right now. We are uh, really ramping up and making sure that we are providing lawyers where we can provide lawyers to tenants. And as the mayor said, we have some assistance available for people on, under certain circumstances. A little louder. In terms of some of the rumors floating around about city shutdowns yeah. and those natures, have you had any sort of just even um, conversations with the governor about how that would actually play out if necessary? about gaming out these exercises sure. and stuff, but have you had any conversations with the governor? And then secondly, what do you- Can think I just stay on that? No, you'll definitely get the next one. So again, what I wanna make the ground rule since we will be doing a lot of briefings, and then when we're not doing a briefing, our press office will be putting out a lot of information regularly. Obviously, we'll put out information on Twitter, et cetera. If we don't say it, please don't assume it, because there has been misinformation out there. And if anyone, you know, if it's not coming from our mouths, my mouth, or these folks, or official uh, press office or Twitter feed, don't believe it. Uh, but ask us, and we'll give you a quick answer. Um, the understanding I have, some of the stuff that we've seen out there today um, is really, really wrong, <clears throat> really off base. My impression is some of it came from either leaked information or um, extrapolated information from scenario planning, not from actual decision making. The scenarios, I've been to a number of these uh, different types of events. You know, uh, for example, NYPD does scenarios all the time where they talk about you know, 10 different sites where there's an active shooter simultaneously, for example, or there was a terror attack, something like that. It's not real, it didn't happen. They're planning for the unexpected. They're trying to see what their capacity is. So we're gonna run a number of scenarios, but no one should mistake those scenarios for something that's actually happening or being authorized, first of all. To your question about the governor, absolutely, we all are constantly um, comparing notes on the different things that we might do. There's been a high level of agreement step by step. Everything that's been announced, uh, city and state, has been talked about in advance, all the major actions and there's been a high level of agreement. Um, the going forward scenarios, first we need to, I'm sure the state is doing the same, we need to feel that we've perfected them and believe in the projections and the right approach. It's part of why you do the exercises to test them. You're sort of pressure testing different scenarios. And then we're gonna absolutely compare and see if we're all on the same page about how we would handle things. 
but um, it is very much a one day at a time, one hour at a time in terms of taking in new information, making adjustments, while simultaneously running scenarios that are really about weeks ahead and what we would do at that point. Go ahead on the other part. And my second question, up to this point, you, you talked to New Yorkers about remaining calm, you're yep. optimistic, and today, you know, obviously your tone is a little different, you're announcing something very serious. Do you, how do you feel? Have you struck the right tone, the right balance? Up until this point, and where now you're announcing a state of emergency? Sure. It's, uh, this is, we're dealing with the great unknown here, and we all understand that. Um, my strong view is that people do really well when they're told the truth. They do really well when they're given the opportunity uh, to be a part of the solution. And I certainly feel that strongly about New Yorkers. They don't want uh, anything but the the best blunt information we have, but you know they also don't scare easily, and they you know they don't want a panic. That's my view, and I don't think it, I don't think panic is the right thing for any leader to do. I think based on the information that we've had over the last few days, tried to really be clear that this thing was ramping up and we were making adjustments, but um, very very concerned as I've said before that. There is a bad scenario where folks in leadership um, ended up creating an atmosphere of panic, uh, ended up creating an atmosphere where everyone went too far in terms of some of the steps that could be taken and therefore created huge unintended consequences and hastened the day when that last line of defense wouldn't work. And I think that's a, again, this is, everyone has their own analysis, but this is mine. Protecting our ability to do the most basic stuff is absolutely crucial here. And that's not gonna happen if uh, people believe uh, that the only choice is to panic, right? So I think New Yorkers have received ever-changing information very, very well. And I think we've sort of tried to do it in sequence as we knew things, and they've, they've taken it in and made adjustments. They're going to make a lot more adjustments. But it is the strangest thing to deal with an ever-changing diet. I mean, it's the ultimate moving target. You know, we don't have, no day is like the previous day. And that's extremely challenging. Uh, OK. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I have two questions. The first, I just wanted to get a little bit more further clarification on the state of the testing. Um, and I think there's a little confusion because there's swabbing on the front end and then there's the analysis on the back end. I'm talking about the back end testing. Um, the governor today actually said there is a shortage as far as that's concerned, and I don't believe that that's something you have when you, I want to make sure we're speaking the same language. When you say the back end, what do you mean? The, the, t the analysis uh, of the samples. Like the actual getting the results? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering, is is, is that what is determining the priority list? I guess, are, are you limiting the criteria because at the moment you don't have the full capacity to analyze every sample? I'll try and start really, really top level and then my colleagues will jump in. The, I don't want to mistake the delay in the results from the ability to get results. I mean, it's perverse that you have to wait three or four days, but they do come in constantly. And that's why you're seeing the numbers grow and grow. Um, so I think with a capacity of, again, everyone will update and confirm this, but you know, we've said originally we could do dozens a day, and then that advanced to hundreds a day. But when you listen to all those priority areas that require support, that takes up the capacity quickly. And understandable why a lot of people might ideally like a test but don't have those particular needs, couldn't get one right away. I don't love it, and no one loves it, but that's, I, at least there's a logic to it, you know? But I don't think it's about how long it takes for the results to get back. It's about how many physical tests you can do in a day versus what you could do if you have the automation. So that's my attempt as a layman. And to build on that, from a public health point of view, now that we have commercial testing available through uh, hospitals, through ambulatory facilities like CityMD, the public health lab is prioritizing testing healthcare workers who may have been exposed, testing individuals who may be in critical condition, and really reserving that capacity for the, for the sickest. If I may. Please. 
Also, you probably know the governor also approved 28 more labs to get started on fast approval for more testing, which we hope in the next 10, 10 days will yield about 5,000 tests a day. I owe the mayor the specific amount from those 5,000 that are going to be for the city itself. But we believe very, very slowly, but this is ramping up. So to your point, we're going to have more capability to do more analysis. I want to understand is, are, are you limiting the criteria because you know you currently don't have the capacity to test all those anal analyses at the moment? Or if I may, yes. I think we, we, we are doing the criteria because those are the people who need it the most. Regardless of the amount of testing that we would have, those people will still have the priority lining that you heard. Just one other quick question. Um, is the Wall Street trading floor going to be closed? Yeah, the, um, the CEO of the uh, stock exchange was here for our meeting earlier, and we are adamantly um, devoted to keeping the market going. And that's absolutely crucial for not only the city, for the whole nation. Um, and we talked about how to do that and how to do it with, uh, you know, the most minimal staffing necessary. So uh, uh, I believe there's a way to keep things moving that's smart and safe way. staying all evictions uh, in NYCHA, and you are right. working with the courts currently to what help people who are having evictions from the private sector. And have you guys considered at all putting a moratorium on evictions altogether, or at least forcible, forced evictions, both in the private and the public? So I'll start and then pass to the deputy mayor. Again, the, we, are, we are exploring right now under a state of emergency. Uh, how the state of emergency powers affect that particular equation. So we're, we want to do everything we can do, but we have to make sure we're on a firm legal ground on that one. Do you want to add? We have suspended the, the execution of any warrants of eviction in NYCHA, except in very limited circumstances involving criminal activity in, in a NYCHA apartment. Okay. Just to follow is the city preparing for a possibility of an increase of homelessness because of um, it's a fair question. I think um, right now, given that we are taking the actions we're taking, uh, my hope is that would not be the case. Uh, and obviously, God forbid that happened to anyone. Uh, we do have right to shelter in this city. We would find a way to accommodate them. But I think to your question, our, our goal here is to not only avert uh, the kinds of evictions that would happen because people are losing their livelihood in this crisis, but actually frees up evictions as much as humanly possible, even ones that would have been proceeding regardless of this crisis. So hopefully we can stay ahead of it. Do you, I mean, you're, you're talking about six months. <clears throat> Do you really have an idea of how long this is going to impact us? Do you really uh, I, I'm confused by your question. We said our projection today is six months. What are you trying to say? I'm saying where, where do you come up with that calculation? It's, there's no one on earth who can give you a perfect number. Um, this is based, and I'll let Dr. Barbeau, who's the author of the number and who I've been praising for it because I think it's real talk. I think it's being honest with New Yorkers about the duration. Came up with a number, I think, I feel like three or four days ago based on, we started talking, we started in our strategic meetings saying, let's start analyzing what we know and went around the room talking to people about what are you seeing, what would you put as your initial estimate? And uh, Dr. Barbo very quickly said uh, six months based on the growth pattern we're seeing and the time it would take to really come down off it. I mean, to, what, what would be the end? The end would be when um, people are getting well and there's very few new cases and you know, life can start to resume normal. I think it could be six months, obviously it could be more, but it's a lot that has to play out um, before we would get to that point. And to add to that, I would say part of it is based on the experience we had during H1N1, which was the last time the, the world saw a pandemic, as well as what we're learning from uh, what's happening in China and other countries. And I just want to remind us that this is a novel virus, which means that none of us has ever been exposed to it and no one has immunity to it. And so while 
we go through that process, you know, to go back to something the mayor said earlier, 80% of us are going to hopefully have a very mild course, while 20% of us may have to have higher level of treatment, either by going to a doctor or potentially going into a hospital. But the, the rationale for this taking that long, and again, it's our best estimate, is the fact that none of us have ever been exposed to it before. Way back. Mr. Mayor, regarding the large group gatherings, I have two questions. Uh, one, you said Madison Square Garden and Barclays Center could be closed four months. Yep. About how long had you arrived to that? Uh, this is for, you know, over 500 people. Um, so they're never going to have an event in those places under 500 people. And um, we are estimating this is our estimate. We're not putting, you know, this is not a... Uh, binding commitment, but we're saying our estimate is this will go through September at six months. Um, I think that's the right way to think about it right now. Uh, I do. And I feel horrible for them. I mean, I, you know, they, they're very, very important places in this city and lots of people work there and lots of people depend on what they do, but that's just the reality right now. So our recommendation would be the same as we would give individuals who are having those questions about work, about school, and it goes back to the really fundamental. If you are sick with fever and a cough or fever or shortness of breath, don't go. If you are an individual who is who has one of the chronic underlying illnesses that we're most concerned about, um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Lung. immunocompromised and chronic lung disease, then I would think twice, and especially if you're over 50, um, I would think twice about going. I, I'm, let, me, let me be the non-doctor and just say I would, go, I would go a step further than the think twice, just common sense from my point of view. Um, and I know a wedding is a you know, crucial, priceless, beautiful moment, so no one wants to miss it, but I'd say if you're someone with those pre-existing conditions, and particularly if you're over 50, if you go to such a wedding, you should really keep your distance from people. You can be there and you know experience it, but try not to uh, be too close to people. Is what I would argue, just to be an abundance of caution. Uh, it's painful, but I think it's you know better than taking a risk right now. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're talking about gatherings um, of under 500 people, we're still saying we want those halls, those banquet halls, or wherever it is. Uh, to keep their capacity to 50% of what their legal limit is. So uh, it's very sad if anyone has to change their guest list or their plan or do something different, but this is all about protecting people, protecting the couple themselves, protecting everyone there, and people are going to have to make those adjustments. Uh, okay, who has not gone? We're doing the first round, so just reminding everyone the ground rule is if you've gone, hold back, and we'll see if we can get to some others on a second round. Uh, Mr. Mayor, two questions, if I may, because DCPI We can get you uh, details of how each agency is doing that. But look, overall, I'd say everyone is getting a lot of information from all of you and then from the guidance from their departments about the basics of staying healthy, including one of the most basic things, which is if you are feeling ill, stay home. That's really profoundly important. Um, and... What we know about NYPD officers are incredibly devoted to their job, and they're going to you know, always show up uh, to protect other people. But we want them to be mindful. If they're not feeling well, stay back. You know, It only takes a few days. And doctor, I think this would be really, really helpful to give people the truth of from the second you start to feel not well to when you can determine you're actually starting to get better or you got a bigger problem on your hands, whatever that is, how many days do you think that is typically when we're talking about these kind of symptoms? Usually what um, the trajectory is, people will become symptomatic as early as two days from being exposed. Um, I'm not even saying coronavirus, I'm saying just generally. Generally. Generally the cold, flu, et cetera thing, I just, how long? Two to three the, days. Right. So that's, I mean, at the point being, we're not, for folks to know if they're getting well, 
of whatever is going on or they're not getting well is a very small number of days. And we just want people to exercise that caution. And my second question, um, I spoke to your former health commissioner this morning, Dr. Mary Bassett. She said that she was very worried that it doesn't look like New York City is prepared. Her predecessor, Tom Frieden, shared the same concerns. Um, I'm just wondering if you feel like you know, late yesterday, you weren't even saying that they should cancel the St. Patrick's Day parade. Um, did you wait too long to enact these serious measures at all? We have been every day, every hour, assessing and making decisions. Look, you're a very intelligent person. The parade was canceled well before it happened. We were all working to be very, very careful about that decision. This, this parade has gone on since before the United States of America was a country. Not a minor matter. Uh, outdoor event, different from an indoor event. But the more we looked at it, the less comfortable we got, given everything we're seeing. I don't blame anyone in the world for being really careful about that decision. But the parade, you know, the cancellation of the parade had to happen in time for people to not show up. So there was time on the clock. The same with the half marathon. We're all very conscious of that clock. You guys, and I don't mean disrespect, you guys are a little more energetic about reporting on this thing or that thing. We are watching a whole bunch of elements and really quite aware of what it means to cancel something and when the actual event is, so long as the cancellation happens in an appropriate timeline. So we are perfectly comfortable uh, that those decisions were made the right way in the right time. The bigger decisions have been really open with you all. There is a real price to pay, and we've tried to balance that price uh, because what we see is a lot of danger in overreach and trying to strike that balance. And we think at this point, and the state and the city got to the same conclusion on the same timeline, that this was the time to now uh, take it to the next level, and then we can escalate that very rapidly if we need to. I don't know what our... Uh, both those are folks, you know, one, uh, Mary worked for me for a number of years, Tom, someone I know for a long time. They both now to reach me, if they have something they want to say, they're more than welcome to call. Oxiris was uh, Mary's deputy, more than welcome to offer their concerns. I don't know what they're talking about, and I don't know if they understand the details of what we're doing or what we've been doing all these weeks. So we're very confident that we're taking every step instantly when it's needed to be taken. Can you just say what the tipping point was for the state of the the uh, actual need to take uh, specific actions. Um, you know, when the governor and I talked, and we got to the point of feeling that we were going to do uh, the kinds of things that would take that kind of intervention, even though the state was gonna go out uh, with its uh, actions first, it's quite clear we're now in that vein where we're going to be limiting events and taking very physical actions. Until we were sure of that, it was not time uh, to declare it because I didn't need to use those specific powers. Now it's time. Go ahead. En español, canciller, nos puede decir la situación de las escuelas en español. Sí, las escuelas públicas, como había dicho el señor alcalde, hoy en este día cerramos un edificio que tiene dos escuelas. Esos estudiantes van a regresar mañana pero de abundancia de, de cuidado y tomamos esa decisión. Sin embargo, con la declaración de emergencia que ha hecho el señor alcalde, uh, vamos a cancelar programas uh, después de escuela, vamos a cancelar los programas de deportes, va a haber otras cosas que se van a cancelar. Para todos los padres de familia no va a ser inmediato, o sea que mañana se van a parar, sino que para mañana ya le vamos a decir cuándo se van a comenzar a, a acabar esas, es, esas actividades para darles tiempo a los padres de familia que hagan sus planes. Uh, aparte de eso, estamos, uh, estamos compartiendo información a diario con las escuelas públicas, uh, estamos en contacto con los administradores y la, los maestros, estamos en contacto también con las escuelas públicas y las que son privadas, las escuelas charter, uh, con todas las escuelas de la ciudad, estamos limpiando las escuelas dos veces uh, de una manera muy profunda, dos veces uh, a la semana y estamos con mucho pendiente uh, de lo que está pasando, si hay circunstancias, si hay niños que uh, están enfermos, eh, estamos pidiendo que nos dejen saber para comunicarnos con el Departamento de Salud. Okay, we're going to finish this one. I'll get my ground rule check here. 
La hold on, I see you, I see you. <laughs> Last call on anyone for round one who has not yet gone, and then on round two, we're gonna do a few, but we're not gonna be able to do forever, so. Thank you, um, If I could ask about a few details about the testing. I guess, first of all, out of the 2,000 tests the city got from CDC, how many are now left? We'll have to get back to you with that exact number. I don't. On the RNA extraction kit component of tests, can you say which manufacturers have not been able to send the extraction kits uh, to labs that are developing the tests? Wow, this is getting deep, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is your natural knowledge. We need to know more about you while you know this. Yeah, it's other reporters. Uh, and yeah, can you say which manufacturers have been unable to meet the demand? And is there a time frame on how long it'll take until they can meet the demand? We'll have to get back to you on the details of the manufacturers. Um, is the city considering using sort of rudimentary testing procedures like the ones China resorted to, like mobile CT cans and fever scans, if, if the CDC approved testing it doesn't come there in time? We haven't discussed that, but I think right now, given all the conversation about testing capacity, uh, I, we could start the conversations, but it hasn't been a, a primary part of the conversations that we've had. Yeah, I think it's, a, look, that's a good question, and I'd say there is a, I'll give you my own imperfect mathematical equation. There's a direct correlation between the unwillingness of the federal government to uh, approve the automated testing, the fact that um, we really are running out of time here, have been running out of time, and we have to find any and all creative solutions. So that specific option has not been fully vetted by us, but we're gonna look at a lot of different ways to proceed. If we don't have anywhere near the testing capacity we should have, we gotta be as creative as we can be. Would the same thing go for, there's an alternative test, not FDA approved, really long name, New York, SARS, COV2, real-time RT, PCR, diagnostic panel. I think CDC's written about this a little bit. Is, it, is that the same thing goes for that, or is that on your radar? Again, we'll have to get back to you on that detail. Yeah. All, everything's being looked at. Okay, who has not gone at all? Okay, we're gonna start at this side again. Well, let's see if we can do not too many and we'll try and be quick, go ahead. How is the closure or the restriction on gatherings going to be enforced? Um, as anything would be enforced. I mean, we'll, we'll figure out the departments, but the natural ones to think about, the, the police department, fire department, buildings, health, we gotta, we gotta sort it out. Obviously, it's a few hours old, but there will be an enforcement mechan me mechanism. There's fines involved. We'll be very vigorous. You advise New Yorkers to bike if they can. To what extent are you disinfecting city bikes? And what advice would you give New Yorkers who are considering going on dates? <laughs> 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 okay, you are, you got range, okay. I do not know the answer on disinfecting city bikes. I don't know if anyone else knows. We will get back to, it's a good question. We'll get back to you on that one. Um, look, I, I, this is kind of, it's a fun question, but it's also a real question. It gets to the heart of the matter. I, I, I think it is dangerous to stop living life. You know, this is a crisis, but it is a crisis that will one day end. And, you know, that we're going to lose some people, and that's horrible. But the vast majority of people, even who are affected, are going to live and recover. And then a whole lot of people will not be affected. I mean, every nation in the world, that is still a factual matter. Not every single human being gets it. And you, we understand the real numbers around what happens to those who do. So we got to keep living life. Um, people, you know, cannot get to a point of hopelessness. Uh, I do think it's fine to have a social life, but you gotta exercise some smart rules, right? If you're sick, don't go on a date. If the date is sick, don't go on the date. People should probably over-communicate about things like that, right? Hi, are you sick today? Um, the, so, and I do, look, I think people are being, in the scheme of things, you know, they're not, we're all humans, we're not perfect, but people are being pretty damn responsible. They understand this is serious stuff. So the other thing is, you know, with a date, uh, you know, you might keep a little more distance than you might have before, right? That's okay. I saw one thing the other day that said a date didn't end that great and they did not kiss each other, you know, on the cheek or anything at the end of the date. I think that was wise, especially if it didn't go well. But um, 
people are, gonna, people are still going to be people. How do we be smart about it, right? That's the way I would say it. Okay. Yes. Um, wondering, are the disease detectives maxing out on their capacity to keep up with these cases and track contacts? Yeah, we're doubling the number as we speak, and we're going to keep augmenting. Yeah. Um, is the city keeping track of how many people you guys have turned away from testing? Um, if not, why? We, we don't, I mean, again, uh, why don't you, the vast majority of the health uh, work that's done in New York City is not us. So I want you to just be careful with your question when you say the you guys. It's doctors, doctor offices, clinics, urgent care, private hospitals, nonprofits. None of that is us. Then there's health and hospitals. That's actually us. In someone's record, we would. Uh, every, we, any patient who comes in, we open up a record and we would document what we recommended for that patient. Do you have a number, an estimate? No, I don't. Um, and also, is City Hall planning to close? No. Public gatherings of 500 or less of inside gatherings. How does the city plan to handle Times Square, uh, Bryant Park in the springtime? The weather warms up. Sure. So let me start as the layman, and then the experts will jump in. I mean, outdoor and indoor is different. We're still trying to understand this disease. Um, but, but, you know, define, it's, a, I think, a definitional matter that outdoor and indoor is different. Um, uh, uh, you know, circulating air makes a difference. Uh, Times Square can get pretty No question, no question. I mean, it's a very fair question, but I'm saying, I just want to start by saying we, we would take a different view of anything outdoor. But you're right that we have to try and figure out without the kind of, Indoor is defined, right? If you got a venue, you know how big it is. It's kind of, it has entrances. It's like, you know, you can actually enforce that. Outdoors all over the city, that is a much more challenging matter, although you're right, there are some places that will focal point. We got to figure that one out. That's, that's a, to me, that's like a real higher level challenge. But I do think, again, I don't know many situations where people have gotten most of two months of nonstop uh, warnings. And if that wasn't enough the last few days, it probably have really done it for a lot of people. So I do think there's a consciousness, and we see it manifesting in people's activities and behavior, that to be more careful and to do some things differently. We got to think about what we can do about outdoor venues like that. Um, but I do think the people themselves are already acting in many ways. Y'all want to add anyone? I think you got it. You just had it all. Uh, uh, Rich. Just uh, to the scientists on board here, is there any indication that a change in temperature upward is going to um, in any way mitigate the, the spread of this disease? I'm sorry, Mr. President. What did you say? <laughs> no, just a, so, uh, that, was, that was my homage to uh, Trump saying it would go away when the weather got warm. Go ahead. We have had conversations with scientists um, in different institutions, and given the fact that this is a novel, a novel virus that we've never seen before, it's hard to predict what temperature will do, uh, ambient temperature will do with it. Um, I should really say seasonal changes, not ambient temperatures, because that might mean something different. So there's no way to know, you know what's going to happen when the spring comes, when the summer comes. Um, we can't predict whether it's going to behave like influenza does, that typically it's got a very defined um, you know, September to March, April kind of trajectory. OK, this side. Um, to the mayor and the medical doctors, there have been a couple of articles in the past few days about Italy, for example, being overwhelmed in the health system, and today the Washington Post wrote about Iran building mass graves. How abreast are you guys keeping up these sort of international developments? And when you read something like that, it freaked me out. But uh, how, does, how do you guys deal with that? Do you plan more? You know, how do you react to those sort of horrible developments? I'll start, and my colleagues can jump. I mean, they're really, really troubling. I've read in particular a number of accounts of what's going on in Italy, including first-person accounts, doctors and, and patients and all. It's very, very troubling. Now, I cannot emphasize enough that they started so far behind. I mean, China started even farther behind because there was mass governmental denial of the obvious. But Italy just, you know, it was already established by the time they all even had a sense that there was something to pay attention to. I mean, that's my layman's interpretation. You know, they were in full-blown crisis before they even braced for impact, as opposed to 
the United States, which in general, and certainly at the state and local level, has been preparing for this in a lot of ways and warning people. You know, again, January 24th was our first press conference on this. First case was March 1st. I mean, that's a real, real different than Italy. I think Iran was the same thing. Iran went from no, no indication of anything to like giant problem in a matter of days. They were not ready, also not transparent. South Korea, that started in a particular religious institution and blew up. And I just don't think there's a parallel to, we had the benefit of seeing everyone's experience, all of us, and getting ready. I also think it's just objectively we have a much stronger healthcare system, notwithstanding its problems, we just do, and this city especially in this country. All that should give us a little more hope. But to your question, yeah, it's sobering as all hell when you read those reports, and no one should take it lightly. And that's where I said to you guys, and I'm not happy to tell you, but you know, if I can see a thousand cases by next week, you know, of course we are worried about where that takes us and how we deal with it. And that's why we're going to be planning for anything and everything. Just to add to what the mayor said, um, we have staff who part of their job in this response is to make sure that they stay up to date with the scientific literature because as we've been saying, every day we're learning something new and we look at studies that are released. Additionally, we talk to scientists uh, at the World Health Organization. We talk to public health practitioners in other cities to learn from what they're experiencing so we can integrate that into the longstanding plans that we've had. Um, and so, you know, part of this, part of the role of public health is to anticipate a number of different potential scenarios and put measures in place that will help address the spread in the immediate period and in a situation like this then over time reduce the the speed of the spread and reduce the potential harm to those New Yorkers who are most vulnerable. I have two questions if I can. Um, the first is there's been uh, I guess a request and, and people are interested in knowing not just borough by borough data but some better general ideas geographically about where there are cases. Does the city have any plans of saying, you know, we not just Queens, but more specific to the neighborhood? Because I think a lot of people are getting concerned when they see these numbers growing and they don't know where exactly. They I, I would say a couple of things. And again, the, the doctors will jump in. I appreciate the question. I understand the question, obviously. We're all humans. It was something happening in your neighborhood you want to know. On the other hand, um, when we say in community spread, just the assumption should be this is something that's going to reach into every corner of the city, whether we like it or not. And I don't think it's particularly productive, meaning I don't know what you do with that information. I don't know how you change your life or what you think, unless there's a, excuse me, an indication of a cluster. That's something we absolutely will talk about. We do not have that at this point. Uh, so as you saw from those numbers, we're spreading out over 8.6 million people, uh, you know, 95 cases. So what I, would what I would say to you, you can be guaranteed of, is if we see something actionable, if we see something that tells people something or that explains something that is strategic, if you will, like obviously with uh, Westchester, knowing there was a cluster led to a whole lot of decisions and actions and people needed to understand that, we would do that in a heartbeat. But I think in terms of saying, oh, you know, we've got, uh, let me do a real life example. You know, if the Brooklyn number is 24 uh, for a borough of uh, 2.6 million people. Um, you know, if I told you there, I don't, I'm not saying this is real, but if I said, oh, there's one in this neighborhood, one in another, two in that, I don't think it tells you much, but I think a cluster would. Does anyone want to add or? If I may, go ahead. let me just, I think there is another piece that the mayor has spoken about before many times. It hasn't come up now. And that is, we need your help with the stigma that this is uh, generating. It's, we hear of real serious consequences of people that uh, have been singled out uh, over the course of the past weeks. We are as transparent as we can be. The mayor has been very forthcoming, but now we need your help in protecting those people because frankly, we're changing their lives. That's right. So I had asked last week about a lot of the external workplace, like a lot of students, particularly in D75, but a place like nursing homes. I'm hearing from people who work in that that it's absolute chaos. The kids are going to a nursing home to find out that it's closed. Will that be included in the non-essential cancellation? You got that right. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. 
And, and we, we've identified all of our medically fragile students, all of our fragile students, um, and if they are participating in any kind of those uh, programs, we've actually already stopped those, those internships. So there, and when did that go into effect? Because I heard of people this morning that they were still sending kids. Yeah, there, that's been in effect for at least the last 48 hours, but we, we can get some more verification for right. you. And we need to make sure every school is yep. fully cognizant. A couple more? <clears throat> I wanted to ask about the, the school closures. There's a couple, couple aspects of it um, we're trying to get clarity on. One is just kind of the timing between the fact that it looks like the DOE or whoever was notified by the, the student's family. Um, the, the student noticed, Wait a minute, what are we talking about, the Bronx? The Bronx. Okay. Yeah, uh, the student or, or their family notified officials before um, the okay. city got the results of the state. No, no, I, I want to, I'll jump in because I know some of this. We don't have the confirmation from the state. That's why I said to you, potential. Very, very important. We don't have, we got a self-report, which we were going to honor in the first instance, better safe than sorry, you know, abundance of caution. But we need to get that confirmation from the health authorities, from a medical source, to determine the next course of action. To that there appears to be a directive to schools not to report cases directly to the Department of Health, and we just wanted to understand that because perhaps. Where are you getting that? I'm sorry. I believe there was a memo uh, distributed to schools. Well, I have not heard we, that. Do you? We get the results directly from the labs that run the test, and so there's no need to do that double reporting. Right, but in this case, for example, you did close the school because you learned from the student, and um, I guess if you're waiting for the state lab, th doesn't that create some, some delay? Yeah, there's a real issue here, and this gets back to the automated testing. It really does. It's a very fair question. If we had the automated testing, again, thousands per day results in hours. That's what we need. We're, we're fighting a war here without enough ammunition. So the we did not have 7 seven thirty this morning when i uh, was informed and made the decision we did not have the benefit of the confirmation from a medical professional or from you know the the state so we had to work with imperfect information um you're absolutely right. Well, will, will this be a repetitive pattern? It's something we'd be very, very concerned about. But you know, I want to believe one way or another we're going to find a way to get to that automated testing, and then that will change the entire equation. Right, but in the interim, does it make sense for schools to have a directive to not report cases or suspected cases to the health department? If I'm understanding that, yeah, there, there is no directive. There's guidance that we've given schools, and as the mayor has talked about with increasing numbers of people that are now coming out, uh, what we don't want to do is inundate the Department of Health with all of these kinds of cases. We have ongoing daily, almost hourly contact with the Department of Health. We have designated people that we work with. So for us to funnel that information to the Department of Health is, is much more structured. We're trying to put structure into place than having random, uh, array of uh, people calling the Department of Health and then using their very limited resources to have people try to figure out is that valid or not. In this particular case, we had a trusted reporter. It was a parent uh, that we, we said it sounds credible, uh, a student, and as the mayor has said, in perfect circumstances. And uh, again, I think this really speaks to the notion that we want to err on the side of caution and abundance of caution uh, as we work through some of these imperfections. But I think the underlying point to your question is a very fair one. Uh, even though I want to believe the automated testing will solve it and solve it soon, there is still a reality that we have to figure out how to get that information from the second it comes into our possession to the right people to make the analysis. I don't think every report will be created equal. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't think every report will be created equal. I think we're going to get information from people that some cases we may be able to verify much quicker, sometimes slower. I think you know we're going to have times where um, the timing will be different where we have more time to double check before we have to make a decision. So, uh, but you're, I think it's very fair to say, and we'll work on this, 
wherever a report comes up, no matter how informal, we need it quickly and we need yeah. you know, all the pertinent people who need to analyze it to get it. Way back. Um, uh, if the governor said this morning that in New York State the test is free, does that mean free free or does that mean no copay free or does that mean we'll bill you later free and also what are we doing to assuage the fears of undocumented persons? Sure. We've uh, said in many of these press conferences, and I'll say it again, uh, no one who is undocumented will be asked their documentation status. We don't do that as the city of New York. Health and Hospitals doesn't do that. Uh, we already uh, last year said to undocumented New Yorkers we're guaranteeing health care uh, without any question about uh, documentation status and to all New Yorkers that we want people to make sure they have health care if they cannot afford it. Uh, we're going to work with them. We're either going to help them get insurance, uh, get an NYC care, pay what they can pay, but we're going to get them health care. But on the uh, issue of the test, look, anyone has insurance and doctors, I think this is sure. self-evident. If you have insurance, the test is covered by insurance. Correct. Uh, if you have no insurance, no nothing, uh, we're going to make sure you get the test for free. Uh, on copays, I think there was an action on copays by the state, but I, I don't know. Does anyone know that one? I believe you're correct. Sir. We can they check waive that. Copays. I think they waive the state create a rule to waive copays, but you can check that. So if there's no insurance, then it is entirely free without that for New York. Correct. Uh, Mr. Mayor, or maybe not even for you, but for Dr. Barbo, what is your advice to public school parents? who have one of those serious underlying conditions and yet their kids are going to school. You mean the, the child has an underlying condition? The parent. Oh. The parent at home has an underlying condition. Right. And, and the kid's going to school and potentially contracting coronavirus. What is the advice to those parents at home? Should they try to isolate from their kids? What are the best practices here? So I think the most important thing is for parents to be vigilant about potential symptoms in their children, uh, cough, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and to have a low threshold for reaching out to their pediatricians to uh, assess what could be accounting for those symptoms. At this point in time, I wouldn't recommend parents isolate themselves from their kids. I think at this point in time, we need parents to spend more time with their kids. I, I'm sure that a lot of children out there are feeling anxious about what they may be hearing or seeing on TV. And we want to take this opportunity f to remind parents that there are resources for them uh, to share accurate information with their children and to assure them that there are things that we all can do to keep each other healthy. Um, you're not sure how many tests the city has right now. I think Politico reported 500. Is that not accurate? The 500 tests have been uh, done according to our reporting. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have a, a more exact number on the current amount of tests. So we're running tests all day, so I don't have the latest figure. I'm sorry, your capacity. You mean per day? No. How many tests could you do if you needed to do, if 1,000 people oh, so we can do 60 a day, uh, and we That's are- That's a public health lab. The public, just the public health lab, and we are working to increase that to somewhere between 100 and 120 per day, um, and then that adds to the capacity of the commercial labs where we anticipate that they can do thousands per day. Okay, we're at the end of the line. Yeah, I want to ask about some proposals kind of circulating in the council. Um, Brad Lander and Richie Torres are sort of forwarding a proposal to, in which you would order the NYPD to stop making low-level arrests uh, for violations and misdemeanor, the idea being uh, prevent the potential spread of the virus in jails, courts, and precincts. Their other idea was to order the courts to consider releasing anyone in pre-trial detention who's over 60, same justification. Have you thought of measures like that? Is, is that something we could expect potentially under the emergency order? Um, no, that's not on, let me first say, just let me break this into pieces. Is, is that something we're planning on right now? No. Uh, is it something that's sort of a front burner issue we're adjudicating right now? No. Is it a perfectly fair things to talk about? The uh, second one, um, you know, there, there's an argument, obviously, if there's a health specific danger, that's a very real issue. So we should talk about uh, if we want to put any criteria in place around the health of an inmate, but uh, in addition to what we have right now. 
But the first one, it, it, my immediate response, I'd be happy to talk to them about it, but my immediate response is no, that uh, this, is, this is exactly an example of the fact that we cannot think coronavirus is the only thing happening in our lives and in our city right now. You know, our police officers still have to fight crime every day. There's not like there's some timeout that criminals take because of coronavirus. Uh, you know, people still need a livelihood, right? I mean, you go down the list, children still need an education. The, 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 the entire society has not gone from there is no, we didn't even know what coronavirus was, to now the only thing we can do is coronavirus. We just have to strike some balance. So I would not want to see the NYPD not arresting someone who deserves to be arrested because of coronavirus. That doesn't follow to me. Okay, everyone, thanks very much. We'll have more tomorrow.